Like everything, mate, we have to we have to start at the beginning. And so basically, I think to share with people your first memory of drums and music, and basically how you got into it all. How did it all start for you, mate? Well, my my dad's a musician. He uh, originally got me playing piano because um, he's a pianist. So um, I did lessons, piano lessons, from oh, from the age of about six till about nine, um, and it really wasn't for me. I, I, as much as my dad wanted me to be a pianist like him i was just so interested in, in the drums um and going to his gigs and hanging around with the drum you know next to the drum and just watching you know because drums as when you're a kid drums are like a massive thing aren't it just loads of bits going on as cymbals and it's just you know for a kid it's like wow this is amazing and you hit them um so i sort of got into and and who actually the drummer that my dad used a guy called alan savage um who became my drum teacher um, from an early age? Uh, I used to I used to watch him play a lot. So I was probably like nine, ten mm -hmm. when I first started playing or got my first kit. Um, my dad drove down to London and we went to um, Charing Cross Road, and um, I didn't have any cymbals, so we set up the kit in, in the in in one of the one of the rooms at home. And I used to, I used to, because I didn't have any, no cymbals to no hi-hats or anything. I had a hi-hat stand that I used to hit the rod. So okay. I just, so I just, so I just go. K -k 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 Probably sounded like the, uh, the thing from Steptoe and Son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back, back, it was. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. So, right. yeah, so I, that's how I, it, yeah, I got started doing that with him. And obviously because of my dad's, um, influence and what he did as a job I wanted to go into that really so my dad got me doing sort of working men's clubs with him when I was like 14 and we'd go in the car together like duo mm -hmm. and go and do working men's clubs around Birmingham because that was kind of the, the nearest place that had that still had that scene of working men's clubs and backing acts and stuff like that so like all the acts would still you know cut their teeth you know like you'd get like ventriloquists and comedians and you know and that was my first sort of taste of reading as well my dad said you know you get like dodgy charts off a singer or off a or off an act so which my dad had been doing for years and years that kind of stuff so it was that was kind of a, a bit of a stepping stone into into you know experience Craft. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and, 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 it, and it, yeah. you don't get those anymore you don't get that that's that's that scene's gone unfortunately mm. i mean they're still, they're still working men's clubs but the backing band sort of thing's not really a thing now not so much um, no, no it's not really um i mean like so, so your dad was the md for gene pitney right yeah that's right yeah 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 so i seem and to remember did. that you told me um in the past mate when we've kind of caught up we've been speaking about your career that you mentioned that there was, there was a scenario that led you to kind of actually go and um, literally in the deep end on a particular um, tour with him. Well, that was, yeah, that was when I was, um, oh, how old was it then? 18, I think. It was 1991, I think it was. And um, Alan Savage, the drummer I was talking about, he couldn't do this particular tour. And obviously I'd sort of like, you know, had been by now left school, sort of started professionally. I think I've done one pantomime. So my dad said, oh, I, I, you know, I'd like you to do the tour with Gene, you know, and I'd grow, grown up listening to Gene because my dad had been his MD for a long time. Um, mm. uh, so I'd grown up listening to it. So I knew the stuff inside out, but obviously I had to play it. So my dad, I, I had to audition. My dad auditioned me really? um, in, in our garden shed. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, where, where yeah. I had my kit set up. He, uh, the bass player who did the gig at the time lived locally so he called him up and got him around so okay. we sat in, in 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 the shed the three of us yeah. going through all the Gene Pitney uh, uh, set and yeah I ended up going to Australia probably a couple of months later and that was my first proper tour but mate I was just looking you know um obviously before the chat today mate I wanted to just remind myself of some of the people that you play for and it's it's a really great diverse kind of like list of people and there's so many things we could talk about but I wanted to bring up I recall seeing you playing on Parkinson once with George Michael, which yeah. I know must have been, I mean, an incredible um, experience for you because, you know, God bless him, he's not around anymore, but he's such mm. an icon then and obviously he is yeah. now. And I wondered if you could share, or you'd like to share with everyone how that came about. I'm, I'm a, I think it was a one-off, but maybe you could share with us what, what happened. Yeah, that, it, yeah, it was a, a one-off. Um, 
uh, and it's do you know it's the only time I've 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 been starstruck actually actually woo, that's that's George Michael you know I, I remember him coming in when we were rehearsing he he came into the room and I was introduced to him by his manager and I shook his hand and it was it was a moment you know because there was an aura around him he had a, he had a, he had a he, you know it was. I mean, at that time, 2006, I think I did that. I mean, he was, you know, he, I mean, he's been mega famous since the 80s, but he, yeah. he, he was like a god. He, yeah. he was, um, and he came in. But that get, that came about because I was playing for Natalie Imbruglia and her management was the same management as George Michael. Uh, and it was literally the day before. It was a call saying, are you around uh, to, to do a rehearsal? And then... Uh, uh, a TV show, which is Parkinson, um, and I was like, "Yes, of course I'm around." <laughs> yeah, it's just let me just check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, I'm definitely around. Even, even if I'm not around, I'm yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. I'll, <laughs> so, I'll, sh- I'll shuffle a couple of things around, but I'll yeah. be there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, but it was yeah, it was great. Yeah, we did. I mean, it was all his band. It was Chris Cameron, the MD. It was Steve Walters on bass, who uh, uh, who I knew anyway. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else is it Phil Palmer Danny Cummings was on percussion just kind of session proper, royalty proper heavyweights yeah yeah yeah, yeah. a little old mate walking oh. in <laughs> it was well I remember seeing it, was, it mate I remember seeing it and thinking man it's like we married with George Michael and it's yeah, yeah, great man and I yeah, and I, was, knew yeah, how much, it, I knew how much it must have meant to you and I yeah. and I mean I love that particular track anyway mate I mean um, yeah but yeah well, that was a must have been it was, it, was, it was a highlight definitely of my career that was and I, and I think watching him was a real treat because he was such a perfectionist. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was it was a it was a it was a proper pinch yourself moment that was with him. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I guess we should bring it. It, it makes sense because they've been kind enough to kind of uh, connect us in, and it'd be great to um, it'd be great to hear you know um, your experience and why you came over to Natal and, and why you love the drums. I saw you playing Natal maybe a couple of years ago when I was doing Banana Rama at that festival. Mm-hmm. Like the sound of the kit as well. Yeah. Um, and obviously the connection with George, because um, I was with Premier like you were mm-hmm. um, for a while. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I went. I went for the Walnut kit in the end because I saw Ollie Wiseman playing with uh, Anne Marie. Yeah, and I liked the sound of that uh, kit. So that's the really warm. And I went, the toms, the short. Yeah, really toms. warm. Yeah, he's got the short toms as well. Mm. So I went for that as well. So I've got everything by seven, as in oh, really? back toms. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, so what? Um, I think I think from memory that you've got eight by seven, ten by seven, twelve by seven. Yeah, right. That's right. Along yeah. the front, and then and then you've got fourteen, 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 sixteen, six, four, yeah, four, uh, yeah, fourteen, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it looks it looks good like that. As yeah, well. but, yeah. but I think it, it, I think also it sounds great. I mean, those toms are really warm. Yes. Um, Ollie's done some only... videos for Natal maybe six months ago or something, and and yeah. I really noticed the, like the tuning of the drums. I, yeah. It just sound really nice and. You know, yeah. I can, I can, I can sort of, I can only kind of, um, you know, sort of share the enthusiasm for the drums, mate. Because, like you said, I've been, I've also been playing them a couple of years, or a couple of three yeah. years. I think March two thousand and sixteen, I came on board, and just, mm. I don't know, it's like with a lot of things, you know, we've we've been around a little while, <laughs> drug yeah. culture, and um, <laughs> you know, you kind of know what you like pretty quickly. And when I, yeah. when I went to the, when I went to the factory and tried the kit, I just. It felt it felt a very natural thing to do, and like you said, um, a great connection with George Frederick. You know, he's a great artist relations guy and a dear friend. Yeah, yeah. And and the kind of two for me match, which I guess it did for you, mate. Let's speak about Rick. I mean, that's been your of, of the last eight years. Rick Ashley is a major kind of you know artist, and and you've you've been on that extensively for the last eight years. So maybe you want to share some of yeah, that Rick, in the highlights. Rick, How did you come yeah, about meeting Rick? Rick's Rick's gig came about from. There used to be a like a rewind kind of thing. There was a thing called Here and Now, which was like where eighties artists would uh, do a do a gig, multiple artists. So um, Rick was one of them, and I don't know, like Kim Wilde, uh, Nick Kershaw, Go West, and instead of and a lot of those guys at that point had, had not been working a lot really. They sort of came out of their shell to do these 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 tours and gigs, one off gigs, and you'd have a house band. To back them all, so uh, I sort of got involved with that uh, as as the drummer for the house band, and then from that ended up doing various gigs. With like, like I've done some stuff with Nick Kershaw, I've done some stuff with Kim Wilde, um, but then Rick's gig sort of came about, and um, 
he he wanted to go because he retired basically for twenty odd years, and then I remember yeah. this this yeah this this got him back into doing gigs again. So he he all of a sudden wanted to do gigs. So we we just ended up doing, we started off doing butlings and things like that, and he and he went down a storm there as you can imagine, and to see him go from from that to back up to you know kind of where he was back in the 80s i mean the last tour we did was arenas it's yeah. it's amazing and he had a number one album three or four years ago um i mean he basically nice... his voice is still exactly as it was to me is it oh yeah is I, a I, I listening think, back I, in the day yeah I, I i think i think his voice is better now actually it sounds a lot better a lot warmer um and he's been he's you know he's is now sort of doing writing his well he was he was always writing his own stuff back then as well but actually you know proper having control of it now and you know uh, doing stuff that he wants to do mate i think i think it's really nice for someone like yourself who you know i know we kind of take it for granted because we've been doing it a long time but there's obviously and there's only so much we can fit in in a conversation like this but you know someone like yourself you've got such a depth of knowledge and experience of all those thousands of gigs that you've done on over the years and I think it would be really nice for you to share you know any kind of tips for up, up and coming players or even seasoned players that what what you see as being a real strength or an importance as a drummer for you know playing for an artist yeah I mean it's experience isn't it at the end of the day and I think if, if you can just play as much as possible also play different stuff you know don't just be a one trick pony and just try and play a certain style um you know, I was in a jazz trio, even though I can't really play jazz. I was in a jazz trio when it, when I was back in Northampton for two or three years. And we used to do tons of gigs, like little uh, sort of wine bars and stuff like that. And you, you just learn so much just from playing these songs. And even though I'm not a massive jazz head, it's, it's it, you know, you really do open up, um, mm-hmm. you know, to, uh, to, to other things. Um, my dad gave me the best advice ever when I was younger. He said, never be the best player in the band because you'll never learn anything, which I thought was really cool, you know. That's a really good thing it's, to say, it's, yeah. It's, it's, you know, you can always learn off other people, always, you know. Yeah. Whether they're young or old or, you know. I definitely think, you know, like anything in life, you kind of mirror who you're around and you, you absorb the, the people that you're with. I mean, you yeah, yeah, some, playing with great bass players is a real necessity and I think both me and you have been really fortunate to play with some great bass players. Yeah, you? and I think that makes all the difference, really. The bass the bass and drums have got to be solid. I, I, I mean, I think bass is probably 60% of the groove, really. It's yeah. more than it is the drums. Yeah. You, you, you've got to have someone so locked in with and, and solid, because we've all played with bass players who are, you know, not quite right. Issues, and, 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 I th- and I think the other way around as well, I think, you know, you, if, you hear a, if you hear a bad drummer in a band, it's really, it, 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 it controls the whole thing. And it can, you know. Well, I mean, going back to Rick's stuff, mate. I mean, obviously, Rick's had a loads of hits, you know. And um, I guess within that set list, I mean, it's a, it's a really widespread sort of styles. I mean, there's sort of quite a high energy gig, I'd imagine. Yeah, you know? it is. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to Stock Aitken and Walkman days, everything was kind of the same same tempo. It was all sort of like yeah. 120 BPM. Um, but yeah, no, his, his, his gigs are workout. And the thing is, he likes gigging. So we'll do gigs that will go on for two hours, two and a half hours sometimes. Right. Because if he's in the mood, um, he'll just, he'll just you know, go, let's, let's do this, let's do that. Or um, it's one of those gigs. He also plays the drums as well. Oh, does so, he? Yeah, he gets up and plays the kit. So um, are we, uh, it's, a real, it's a real shame we didn't get him on this call, man. We should, we should try and get him you know, at some point to join us. Well, as if by magic. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> Have you got a text from him or something? <laughs> yeah, he's going to come on. He's going to come on. We'll find him. No, really? Oh, man. That would be amazing yeah, yeah. if we could get him on here, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get him on. Let's, let's get him on. Wow. Rick Ashley's joined us, everybody. I can't believe it. Hey. Nice one. Uh, I can't believe Wait, he just te- I can't believe you text Simon just then, and here we are together. This is great. Yeah, there you go. The wonders of modern technology. There you go. <laughs> I know. I hope you're well, Rick. Even I- drummers can do it. <laughs> You say that. It actually took me four goes to get in touch with Simon, but that's another video. Right, okay. <laughs> um, but listen, Rick, it's really good of you to join us. And um, listen, it goes without saying that music and singing is a massive part of your life. But I know that you're a massive keen uh, drummer fan as well. And I wondered 
if you'd be kind enough to share with people how you got into drums, if you've got any early memories of drums and getting into Yeah, that. of course. Um, I mean, the first band I actually joined, I joined as the drummer. Um, I did sing a little bit occasionally. We used to do some police covers, so I used to sing like so lonely from the drums. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, at the age of 14, 15, it was hard <laughs> enough to try and play the drum part, never mind sing it as well. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, um, I mean, Stuart Copeland is still and was always one of my all-time favourite drummers just because of a very unique style and mm. sound as well. And, you know, I mean, obviously that whole thing of the reggae influence and, you know, trying to work out where one is, that was always quite interesting with police records. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think from 14, 15, for some reason, I had sung in the school choir, in school plays, all that stuff, but... I didn't really want to be the front man, to be honest. And as Simon can probably tell you, I'm not 100% sure I still ever want to be the front man now. <laughs> I'm very happy to jump on Simon's drums when he lets me when we're out gigging. Um, but um, I, th I think the thing for me is that drums have a very unique uh, place in music because um, there's almost no style of music, whether it's, you know, back in the day to Sinatra, or, or right up to, to today with, you know, something, let's even say like a, a dance record or what have you, that, you know, the actual, what someone's actually playing uh, from, a, from a drum perspective or the beats perspective, it's massively important in every genre of music. And I think I've always kind of loved that about it. And I, I'm going to flatter Simon now and possibly make him blush. And that is that he's always first on the team sheet because without that, I don't feel comfortable. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And... I think I've always been the same from, from being a small kid. It's been very much about drums to me is related to how I sing. And if I've got somebody playing drums that I really love and, you know, like the way they play, I sing better because mm. my timing's better. I was going to say to um, to you, Rick, I mean, as a, as a singer and as an artist, which you've kind of pretty much sort of said there, but I mean, is it sort of on stage, you know, when you've got kind of Simon behind you, I guess the qualities you look for in a drummer is just being solid and being musical and having that and, and having that great feel that Simon's got. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you say being musical as well, and that's massively important. And I know, listen, drummers are very often the butt of a lot of musical jokes. We are. But the truth of it, the <laughs> truth of it is, I, I, don't think I've, I don't think I've met and worked with a drummer, like a pro drummer, somebody who's actually doing it, you know, up there for real on that level, who isn't unbelievably song-based and musical and knows everything about what's going on in terms of what people need, what they don't need, and just the kind of, just understand songs. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I think I think when Simon and I are chatting, or, or the whole band are, and we're talking about, let's say when we do covers, for instance, Simon definitely is one of the first to sort of chip in and go, well, that, we shouldn't do that bit. We need to just jump straight into this because that's not really working. You know, and I think, I think understanding um, what the song needs and what everyone else needs is massively important. I really, mm. really do. And I think modern drummers. They've probably always had it, to be fair, but I think modern drummers now are every bit uh, the all-round musician that, that they have to be, do you know what I mean, mm. to survive in this world, you know, so. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> you talk about drummers, like, from the past, like Stuart, and um, even, even Ringo Starr, which, again, he's the butt of a lot of jokes, but how many sessions have any of us sort of been on where R Ringo has been referenced or the Beatles have been referenced? Totally. His fields are so musical, apart from just being... They're not fields for a field's sake. They're actually musical and they complement the lyric or, or the moment, you know, or the changes between one section to the next. So I mean, I think I think people have very often called him the luckiest drummer in the world. But I, I would sort of I'd kind of turn that round a little bit and sort of say that I think I think the other three Beatles, even Lennon and McCartney, were lucky to have him as their drummer. Because mm. as you say, he there are fills that he played that drummers today still emulate. And as soon as somebody plays one, you go, well, you're doing a Ringo. Exactly. That's, that's pretty amazing <laughs> after whatever amount of years it is now. I don't know, 50, 60 years since some of those early songs. And, you you know, it's it's staggering to think that. Yeah, massive respect to, to Ringo. I think he is yeah. incredible. I mean, similar to uh, Ringo, I mean, for me, just sort of a chain with you guys, that for me, I, I got taken to see um, Phil Collins and Genesis when I was nine. Oh, wow. So yeah. as a nine-year-old kid sitting there you know all my mates at school were into madness who i love and mm. adam and the ants who i love and stuff like that but i was the prog thing kind of blew me away and phil collins and chester thompson in this particular concert i saw in great yarmouth in 1980 was just 
blew my mind. That was my Ringo, really, Phil Collins. Mm. I think most people, you know, probably think of Phil Collins as being the guy out front sat on a piano singing, I know. Uh, you know, and uh, and obviously he's made some fantastic records in his own right, on his own kind mm. of thing. But yes. I think if you go back to him being the drummer in a band, Again, he was just phenomenal, I think. But, he really was. But obviously really understood what, what a song was. Well, I, I, I listened to, um, you know, Rick, uh, Dave Grohl on Queens of the Stone Age of the day, and I hadn't heard it oh, for years. Oh. And, I mean, I've forgotten how good Dave Grohl is. Yeah. At playing the drums. <laughs> you forget yeah. that he started as a drummer. Yeah, two of the best drummers in the world. Yeah. Hit one <laughs> it's not fair, really, is it? But there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and again, you're right. Some of that Queen Queen stuff is is bonkers. Some mm. of some of the playing in that and what have you. And, um, yeah. But again, I've just been listening to the new Foo Fighters record, and you know they they're not afraid of putting drums up front. And again, mm. there's two drummers in the band, really. You know yeah. what I mean? So you can yeah. understand that. But I mean, it's it, he's a very musical drummer as well, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? All the kind of like timings and stuff. And I'm sure yeah. that's the, I'm sure some of that comes from Dave in the songwriting, but. The the, the 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 actual time in the rhythms and the whatever that they use, mm. it's never boring, is it? Do you know what I mean? No. It's I mean ACDC that I absolutely love are like locked into this sort of like boom, gap, boom, yeah. Gap, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's part of and that thing. works. Yeah, it, it works for their style of writing and their songs. And then you've got someone who's probably you know getting up there in terms of size of band, you know, Foo Fighters. And they do something completely different. And some of their rhythms, and some of the the way they'll go from like, well, this is the verse, this is the bridge. What the hell just happened there? You know what yeah. I mean? It's like a totally different time signature. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's really, it's it's a good workout to try and play along to them. I wanted to touch upon, so obviously, um, Simon, like you've come over to, um, to Natal, which is great. And I know you can't wait to get the kit out on the road and do the stuff, you know, with, a, with, with Rick next year, all being... When we can all get back out there on the road, but I know you you both went to the uh, the Marshall factory to Natal, and I w- wanted to know if you could share both share a bit about that day. What about you, Simon? Well, yeah, I went to uh, basically get my new kit, um, and we went up together, didn't we? I think I came to yours, and we, we drove up together. Yeah. Um, and they did a nice um, sort of tour of the factory for us, which is nice. Um, Amazing. And we got to meet everybody, and um, and then Rick got his acrylic kit. I did indeed. I think very nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was great actually because um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of history in that name, Marshall, as well. Mm. I think, and and it, it's a good combo. I think in terms of you know, you you, just, you look at the way music has gone in terms of the big companies and um, how smaller companies sometimes just die away and don't. You know what I mean? And and I think it's kind of. It's really interesting when you see the history of how Marshall started, especially, do you know what I mean? And they're still doing it today and they're still as prized, you know, and that thing about vintage amps now is really, really kicking in, I think. You know, I think people have always been into collecting guitars, but a few of my friends and what have you, and, and Adam who plays with us and what have you, that so it's so into amps and what have you as well. And so it's kind of a nice building to just go and have a little breeze around and have a look around and see that they're still doing it today, how they used to do it and all the rest of it. And yeah, yeah. But the drum thing... It's kind of, I think it's a bit odd. I don't think people understand how people get excited about drums. I just, you either do or you don't, I think. Yeah. And, and, and obviously I still have that thing and, I, and, and I've always kind of wanted an acrylic kit at some point, one point in my life. But, but to be honest, most drummers I've ever spoken to just say they look nice, but they sound awful. But in truth and reality, when, when the actual kit, when we got hold of it and Simon and you had your new, your brand new white yeah, yeah. kit. I mean, that sounded incredible and amazing. You've got it all, you know, sounding great. And um, But literally straight out of the box, the acrylic one, I thought sounded fantastic. Yeah. It was all boxed up and we got it. We got it into Rich Studio. And I remember we were just, uh, both of us, you were over one side, I was over one, both opening going, oh, look at this, look at this. And yeah. I'm going to see you laughing. You were just <laughs> laughing and going, I'm just too excited. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that pure excitement of kind of a new a new kit or, or just getting, getting out of the box for the first time? I mean, I, yeah. I actually have, I've never owned um, an acrylic kit, but I did play one down at the factory. And they're loud, aren't they? They're really lively. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know, which is nice, you know. And, and there's a, I'm sure there are certain... There's applications, you know, for certain drums that you would not necessarily choose one of them. But I think from a visual point of view, they're incredible. Yeah. Um, but I was just really impressed the way it sounded, to be honest. Mm. Um, yeah, because, you know, I'll, 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 I'll dare to say I was going for the look of it more than the sound of it. <laughs> but right. I just thought, yeah, it's just something I'd always wanted. And, um, yeah, I mean, it is it is a fascination, the drum thing, I think. You can, you, you know, 
I mean, one of the things about the reason you were getting it, or at that point, Simon, we were looking into that whole thing with the colour of your kit and, that, and, mm. and, you know, was that when you're lucky enough to be doing the bigger gigs and you know that you're going to have great lights and you can light things in a certain way, I think sometimes it changes your um, thought process of, of what coloured kit you would go for. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Because once you've got a black kit, there's not a lot you can do with it, if you know what I mean. It's yeah. great yeah. and it works perfectly for what it is, but... And um, so there was a bit of that going on as well, really. And um, so yours is clear, transparent, right, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just completely nice. clear. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, great. It, yeah, it's. Um, I think the sound of the drums, I was really, really impressed with. And your yeah. kit sounds amazing, Simon. Your white. Yeah, one. we've only we've only got to use it once so far yeah. this year, but yeah, exactly, it, yeah. it did sound. Well, that's why we got together that day, really, wasn't it? In Ritz was that. You before we went to Australia and New Zealand, where obviously you'd be using like a you know a, a kit they were going to supply and everything. It wasn't going to be your actual personal kit. We needed to get in a room so you could check it all out because literally two weeks after we got back, we were meant to be on tour, weren't we, in the UK doing like a proper tour and everything. Yeah. So you wanted to make sure that you know you'd sorted the kit out and it was all great before we had to hit the road and everything. But and then sadly, obviously, by the time we got back to the UK, that was just not changed. Not, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you guys have obviously done so many shows together over the past. Yeah. I think you've been playing for Rick for eight years, Simon. So yeah, about I mean, that, yeah. obviously, so many, so many shows and tours you've done together. Yeah. Rick, is there any highlights where you can really well, stand well, for out? Me, shows? I mean, I could, I could probably pick quite a few gigs that we've actually done um, that have been pretty special um, for lots of different reasons. I mean, like actual real gigs. But one of the things that we have a bit of a habit of doing. Um, is doing gigs after hours. So we've done our gig and then we'll go play somewhere else. Oh, wow. And one of the things I love about that and I love about the guys and the girls that, you know, and the crew as well that we have is that if I sort of come up with the, the concept of should we go and play somewhere, nobody ever kind of sort of, all right, m maybe sometimes they're not going 100%. But <laughs> most of the time, everyone's like, yeah, let's go find a bar and let's go and play. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. and we've done... Um, you know, we 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 played at uh, Trinity in in Dublin at the university. We played at Cambridge University, um, and that's something I want to do a little bit more. We just literally email them or call them up and sort of say, "Do you want someone to come and play in your bar tonight?" And they're like, "Well, who is it?" And they go, uh, and they go, <laughs> "Yeah, all right then." <laughs> so, <laughs> Why not? So, yeah. And we just come, and we just do covers and stuff. And I think again, that's one of the things I really love about it is that we don't know what we're going to play. We have a few drinks and then we just make it up and and it's like someone starts playing something and I, I think it's one of the things that i really cherish because as much as i appreciate how good the guys and girls who i play with and work with one of the things i really love is that everyone's willing to just sort of say well let's get rid of all the all the technical stuff we've got going on we're just yeah. a bunch of people in a room let's make a noise and see what happens and yeah, i absolutely yeah. love that um but in terms of i guess some of the real gigs we've done um we've done some crazy ones like yeah, i guess you, i think the australian thing we just did simon to be honest australia new zealand that was pretty amazing um i think just because it's you know a lot of the gigs were outdoor at, at, in the wineries and stuff like that um some of the uk things that we've done the big the big christmas thing we did at the o2 for chris evans yeah um last year or the year before i think that was a really special night because it was a charity thing anyway but i think that that brings something else to the thing. Everyone's just a bit more chilled because they know where the money's going. Do you know what I mean? And it's a bit like you can get away with murder. You can sort of have a laugh and a bit of a grin. And I think sometimes that's what I really enjoy is just letting everyone just, just go and just have a bit of fun, you know? Absolutely, man. Um, guys, I think, I think this has been, I think this has been great and I really appreciate your time. Both of you joining this is a bit, it's a bit of fun and, and, and for, uh, for you, Rick, to come on board here for this, Chat is really nice for us, you know, man. And Absolutely, great... pleasure. I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a pretender, and I'm a bit out of my depth in terms of drumming, but no, I man. do love it, and it's never ever left me. And and like I say, I I I just want to say this: why is right there? It, without Simon, I can get by on a gig, but I don't feel he's my comfort zone. And I think that's it. I think for you know younger people who are getting into drumming and what have you. And they're thinking, oh, should I maybe I should start with the guitar because they're always, you know, they're the ones in the spotlight and everything. Believe me, I think I think everybody counts the drummer as the first person on the on the on the you know the list because the team sheet, you know, that that's the first name, and I think that's all important for me. So uh, I love you, Simon, and I love what you do. Yeah, man. Likewise, thank you, mate. You. I like them as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Simon. All right. Listen, thank you, guys. I really Cheers, appreciate Steve. your time. Thanks, and, Rick. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much.